Wow, that is a beard for the ages, man. Oh my God. Nobody sees me right now, so I've just started growing it out. <laughs> oh my God, that's, that's a lumberjack beard right there, man. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, yeah, very interesting. Trying it out, so we'll see. <laughs> Hold on, I'm to see your face, friend. Haven't seen you in thank a while. You. you too, glad to hear you're staying safe out there, staying in the home as much as you can. Yeah, going a little stir crazy. Um, just got a text from a client today though. He, uh, I'm gonna talk to him after we get done with this and he is um, looking at uh, buying a place. And uh, so I had another, I have another client who I was in escrow with. Uh, we opened escrow, gosh, it was about the, I wanna say the 10th of March. Mm -hmm. He had been pre-approved. Pre uh, I think you're familiar with him, but I won't mention his name on here for privacy reasons, but yes. uh, he was going through his, his uh, credit union. And then I got a call from his credit union uh, about a week after we opened escrow saying, you know, given the current situation, we've decided to uh, withdraw the loan. We're not gonna fund it. And uh, several days later, he was furloughed from his job in the entertainment industry. And um, so we had to eventually, we tried other ways to make that deal work, but uh, he had to cancel the escrow. So no. I think it's a perfect segue into some of the questions that, uh, you know, that we'd like to go through for, for potential buyers of property. I, I think that, you know, and I brought this up at a, at an office meeting last week, I think it's going to come down to um, if you were pre-approved and even underwritten. And for those people who don't understand what underwriting is, it's basically all the work that uh, most lenders do during escrow. But if you work with a guy like Michael, um, Michael is one of the great lenders who will do all that underwriting, meaning they'll track down your your pay and the confirmed employment and other um, your taxes, et cetera, to basically um, not just pre-approve you, but pre-fund you for a loan. And the benefits of that are you can make an offer on a property and have a very short or even an, uh, a no loan contingency on a property, which essentially makes you like a cash buyer. Uh, it, it, summary, right? If, if mm -hmm. I get that yeah, wrong, that's I, a very good summary. So. I think it's going to come down to the people that were pre-approved prior to, uh, let's call it uh, April 1st. Um, mm -hmm. Those people are going to have to get re-evaluated. Am I right, right about that? Because if you went into the market based on what you were doing in terms of employment and income pre-coronavirus, your situation may or may not have changed, but lenders are going to want to know that, right? So why don't you sure. talk about what you're experiencing with regard to, let's just keep it to those people who already had a pre-approval in place and they may be going out looking at properties now thinking, well, hey, I was approved or right. even underwritten like this guy. Right. And what are you going to have to tell your, your lender or convince your lender that your situation has basically not changed substantially so you can go forward with your purchase? Um, what's the process that's happening in the real world where, where you work, Michael? So there's three things that I'm looking at with my clients. Yeah, why don't you introduce yourself for a second, Michael, so people know who you are and who you work for so we can get that out of the way. Sure, my, I'm Michael Abram. I'm with RPM Mortgage out in Marina Del Rey, California. We are a direct lender and broker. We work with over 80 different FDIC insured banking institutions, and I've been in the industry for about 15 years now. So you can work magic. Let me just tell everybody, yeah. if you're watching this on replay, um, I will tell you that Michael has uh, saved many deals that I have been involved in where other lenders just couldn't do it. They just couldn't figure out a way. They couldn't find a way past things. And, and so Michael is my preferred lender because he, he performs. And recently I just saw that Michael was one of the top 1% lenders, uh, loan originators, um, I think nationwide, right? Yeah, that's correct. Top so, congratulations on that. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. 
a lot of hard work, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. But. Back to the question, which is how do people who have been pre approved or even pre underwritten move forward from now until we get back to something resembling normal? So the first thing that they want to do is reconfirm their employment status. We're checking that very closely on all our individuals that are pre-approved. So are they furloughed? Have they been temporarily let go? Are they um, still working? These are really key things. The banks are double and triple checking before funding a loan right now, more so than they would normally do prior to funding a loan. For example, if you're self-employed, and you only have your tax returns to go off of for looking at income, we would maybe do a CPA re-verification or look to make sure your license is still active prior to funding the loan. Now, because of COVID-19, they wanna make sure the business is not impacted where it's completely shut down and there's no income coming in. So within the last 10 days of closing, we're gonna ask you for updated proof that your business is still active. And it could be, you know, an updated invoice showing within 10 days from somebody paying you could be proof of receipt of money from a client in your bank statements with a copy of the deposited check. Could even be as simple as just calling the business to see if they're taking appointments, depending on what you do for a loan. So this is a, a highly regulated overlay that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have come out with to try to deal with that. So we, we want to have a better understanding of people's employment situation before going down the rabbit hole. Um, secondly, depending on what program they were qualified on, you absolutely want to double check that this program even still exists. Within the last 30 days, we have seen so much volatility. Um, and even the client that you were mentioning is a good example where you had a bank that said, we just can't fund this loan now. It's just the, the loan is shut off, the, the well is dry, there's no liquidity in some of these products, so the banks have shut it off for the time being. So if you've got anyone that's not doing an A-paper loan, like a bank statement loan or investor cash flow or even expanding hey, debts, increases, anything that's kind of a little out of the box. Yeah. You're yes. breaking up a little bit. I'm not sure <laughs> you have somebody else in the family who's, who's – uh, zooming or pulling video and i'm going to check on my on my end too to make sure that we're not breaking up too much because i'm missing some of your your last uh 30 seconds of what you were explaining and it's oh, i don't have any breakup on my end so okay so hold on. One, give me one second i'm going to go check sure. All right, well, in the time of coronavirus, the um, technical glitches will continue and we'll just have to work through them. Um, but what I wanna go back and clarify for some people who are more um, unfamiliar with some of these terms, when you talk about a uh, product or a pool of money, people just don't go to a bank. I mean, I guess you can. You can still go to a bank and the bank has money and they can fund out of their resources. But what mm -hmm. you do, and what other um, mortgage brokers do is you can fund in-house. You know, RPM has a lot of resources and they can right. do self in-house funding, but you can also go out into the marketplace and find different uh, banks or uh, institutions that have pools of money that um, can provide uh, maybe some of these people who are non-traditional borrowers that mm -hmm. might have different uh, credit or, or employment histories that you can get creative with, right? And so those products are the products that you're talking about have basically dried up because of the stock market crash and because of uncertainty with um, employment and, and, you know, the economic outlook for the next three to six months. Is that correct? That's correct. When you look at like the safety net of where the safest loans are to buy right now, if you're Fannie or Freddie, or frankly, any bank, and you're looking to buy loans and service them, it's the traditional Fannie Freddie product. So these other products, they're great products, but they carry more risk to them from a banking perspective. 
for servicing. So because of that, they're not as comfortable buying these loans to service them on an expanded criteria guideline already in a market where we're really upside down in terms of interest rates, in terms of people's employment, uh, and just product availability. So the safest way to do a loan is those eight paper loans right now. Right. And those, those, when you talk about Fannie and Freddie, again, for people who are not, uh, you know, in the business and they're just coming into, especially a first time buyer, Fannie and Freddie are government operated kind of, uh, they're not public corporations. They're not private. They're kind of a hybrid. It's a long history of what they are, but basically for a borrower, what they need to know is there's certain limits on the amount that they can borrow if they're using a, an FHA backed loan. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. There's loan limitations that are set, and this can vary by county and by state. And so for, for LA County, what's the loan limitation on the purchase price of, you know, uh, a $900,000 property, would that qualify if they put 20% down? Yes, you should be fine there. The loan limitation for LA County is seven sixty five six hundred. So any loan amount that is at that limit or below falls within the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac category of backed loans. And it's a little bit safer. Anything above that loan amount for a one unit property, and by one unit, I'm talking about a house, I'm talking about a condo, uh, townhome, um, those will then be considered jumbo loans. And that is a whole different ballgame of how we qualify mortgage. Right. And those are going to be more challenging, right? Because typically um, a jumbo loan that's going to be above a million dollars, for example, um, they're going to rely on a lot of that pool of money that um, is kind of dried up right now. Is that what you were saying? That's correct. Yeah. So jumbo loans, you've seen some big players exit the game. And a good example is Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo exited the game for everybody. Wells Fargo is not only doing just loans in retail, they're not really touching refinances unless you have a quarter of a million dollars in the bank. They're really putting a lot of extra overlays in place before we really consider touching. Wait, how much money right do you now. need in the bank? Say that again. A quarter of a million dollars. A million dollars? No, a quarter of a million, 200. A quarter of a million dollars. Okay. Dollars. And so, these are yes. with, how, what kind of down payments are you talking about with a jumbo loan then that are getting approved? 20% and more? You still want to be at 20%. Yes. Um, you know, the other way people get around on these loans is to do a first loan and a second loan where you break the difference. The math is exactly the same in terms of the down payment, but you're not doing one single jumbo loan. Sometimes that makes it easier for a consumer to qualify because jumbo loans have such rigid guidelines when it comes to credit analysis, money in the bank post-closing, which we refer to as reserves. Mm -hmm. We've seen reserve requirements increase for some of these banks. We've seen them say things like, we won't accept non-liquid retirement funds anymore for, retire for, for the reserves. So like a 401k or an IRA are not going to be allowed for qualifying as a reserve account? Yeah, some of them have said that. And some of them have said we'll still allow it, but they're, they're a little more steep in how they calculate the av available funds that they would consider for reserves. Meaning if I, if I take a million dollars in a 401k, I might normally qualify you at 70% of that account value. Mm -hmm. for what's available. So $700,000 you can tap into for reserves. Now under some of the revised guidelines, they might say we'll only go to 60%. So they're really capping it to be as more conservative. And that's because of what's going on in the stock market. Because you have so many people losing money on these types of investments that it, it's more volatile to consider those assets as reserves when the market's fluctuating so much like it is right now. Right. So if you're a, if you're a traditional uh, conforming borrower and you're just doing a bread and butter FHA loan, are you still able to come in with a lower than 20% down 
if you have a yes. otherwise good employment employment? Yes, you can still do three and a half percent down on an FHA. In fact, you can still do some of the specialized FHA, you know, little Cal Hafa, where you can do zero percent down. The problem that we're seeing with government backed loans right now with FHA, VA, USDA, Ginny May, all that stuff, those interest rates have taken a massive hit right now because of the stimulus package. As much as it sounds like there's great things in there that'll help the, uh, the consumers, the stimulus package is actually hurting the banking industry. How is that? Um, you're just talking about where the, the liquidity is going and how, how they're backing mortgages right now. So there's more uh, backing going the Fannie Freddie conventional type of products than there are government backed loans right now. So because of that, you're seeing a huge disconnect in interest rates, um, not just on government backed, but even certain conventional loans. If your loan is greater than $510,000, but less than that $765,000 limit, yeah. talking about interest rates that are abnormally high compared to what the interest rates should be. So and, when, you're, when you're talking abnormally high, what are we talking for that kind of uh, a loan then right now? So, yeah, so I mean, depending on your scenario, I can give you an example of a client that I priced out the other day. She was doing uh, five, uh, no, I'm sorry, 15% down. Price point was about 650 on a house. Uh, so you're talking 85% loan to value. So her loan amount is somewhere around 550, 551. So under normal circumstances with mortgage insurance, I would probably say the rates should be in the high threes, maybe the low fours, okay? In a, in a normal market. When I price that scenario out, it's over 5%. And it doesn't make sense because the 10-year treasury is under 1% right now. Right. So what you'd be seeing is rates that are at historic lows. And you're just not. The easiest way for me to say it is the market's broken a bit in terms of how they're allocating the funds to provide liquidity. The safest are the loans that are 510 or less in California in different loan counties where you have a loan limit of that size. It's just the safest pool of loans for everybody to be touching. So those are programs where you'll see interest rates touching the low threes, or perhaps even the twos, depending on what day you're, you're talking about. So, I mean, those rates are correlating to where the market is. It's everything outside of that that is not making sense compared to what it should be. So for a jumbo loan, say it's a million dollar jumbo loan on a, I don't know, a uh, $1.2 million purchase. Mm -hmm. um, they're putting 20% down or whatever the math is on that. Um, what kind of rates are people looking at on those jumbo loans then? You know, given all things being equal with good credit, good down payment, nothing quirky, you're still probably talking about the mid fours for something like that, which you would sit there and say that's not terrible, except if you look at where the market is, you would sit there and go, it doesn't make sense why they're in the fours. They should be a lot lower. And that, again, goes into the safety net of what these banks are looking at, their concerns with jumbo money, because it's not, they, they service these loans. When it comes to jumbo loans, they don't sell those loans. They portfolio them because they all have their own guidelines. And portfolio means they just keep it themselves. They service it. They do it. If Wells Fargo does a jumbo loan, they are servicing that loan. They are not selling it to Chase or U.S. Bank or anyone else because their guidelines can be different for a jumbo loan compared to everyone else. Whereas those loans that are backed by Fannie and Freddie, they all follow the same guidelines set by Fannie and Freddie. So they can comfortably buy and sell loans back and forth to each other because they're all following the same unique guidelines. Got it. That makes sense. So it's, it, it seems like it's going to be a challenge for even people that, that have regular employment and good credit and um, uh, enough reserves and enough cash to come down. It's, it's going to be, I'm sure you're coming up against this where people are maybe rate shopping and they're going, well, why are you four and a half percent, Mike? And they might 
see somebody else who's got a low teaser rate right. and um, you know they're saying well I can get a you know full point below that and I'm reading the paper and the you know feds cut the interest rate to practically zero why am I paying the same or more than I was paying last year so those must be tough conversations to have to go through explaining the uh, the macroeconomics of why there's this inversion of, of rates actually ticking up a little bit. Right. When you talk about the federal funds rate and we talk about the rates being cut to almost zero, what people don't understand is that's basically the interest rate that the banks are being charged for back and forth to each other and dealing with Fannie and Freddie um, and the Fed. And it has nothing to do with short term interest rates that are offered to consumers. It has all of the concern of just trying to give some relief to the banks in terms of how they have to financially pay out for doing business on the secondary market. And the secondary market is referring to loans being sold and bought back and forth between each other. So it's a big part of the conversation because when you see things come out online, just saying rates hit historic lows or Fed cuts interest rates to near zero, the first thing you would think as a consumer is, wow, they, you know, I can get a 30-year fix at 1%. And, and that's just not what's happening right now. You know, what you have to know is did drop last month and we had a huge spike in the industry. And the industry was also just getting ready to see what was going on with COVID-19. We didn't understand as a country, as an industry, how bad this was gonna get. So when you had the dip in the rates, you had an, an explosion in business in the, in the mortgage banking industry. And then on top of that, now we had COVID-19 really starting to impact economically here as well as abroad everywhere. And now it, it led to a complete breakdown in the interest rates. Banks didn't quite know what to do, so which is why we had a huge spike. They stopped the volume because they needed to catch up first off on everything that came in within a couple of week period there and make sure that it's staffing. Then we started going through the motions of people relocating to work from home. And all of this was contributing to pushing rates up because they just didn't understand how to treat all of this. And they needed to slow the volume and make sure that the banking industry survives. You know, I don't think people also realize if you lower the rates too quickly, then you're talking about banks penalizing each other left and right for loans being paid off too quickly. And that's not a prepayment penalty. It's, it's essentially a penalty that banks impose on each other so if you start doing that, you're going to have banks that are going to get hit with hundreds of millions of dollars in penalties back and forth, and it can just absolutely break the banking system. So when you talk about interest rates lowering, there is there is a method to the madness of how quickly they will lower the rates among each bank to make sure that they're looking at, you know, they're, they're hedging everything essentially to make sure that they don't roll into a problem here where they're, they're getting penalized and not being able to do business, period. So let, let me ask you to put on your um, your prognosticator hat and look into your crystal ball. Uh, I'm sure that's, you know, that's the, they used to call it the $64,000 question. I'm <laughs> the $64 trillion question. Um, you know, I mean, my opinion is it's going to take several months at minimum before the the tide is going to shift with some of these issues that you're talking about because, you know, banks are risk averse and, um, you know, they're going to want to see like to kind of circle back around to the, uh, the client that, you know, we were both talking about the one who lost the property. Mm -hmm. um, he's self-employed and, you know, he's going to need to get three, four months, of employment back under his belt before the um, before the lenders are going to come back to him and say, you know what, we're going to go back in, into the non-conforming pool, and hopefully in three months, six months, that pool of money is going to start to come back. I just see like this huge crush of money that the Fed has released, and I think you're right. It's like a to use a really, you know, maybe graphic uh, example, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the economy is a python 
and all this money is a you know a big pig <laughs> and the python has swallowed the pig and right now it's just kind of getting its jaws around it right and it's going to take several months for the to kind of digest down and get that pool of money back into circulation so that somebody who's like our client who um is a non-conforming buyer and looking for something that's maybe just a little bit outside of the jumbo category or mm -hmm. right on the bubble. Um, he's going to need that employment for several months. So that's kind of my take on it as a, as a realtor, but yeah. you know, for somebody who's in the trenches, what do you see happening in terms of timeframes for some of this money coming back into the market and loosening up some of these guidelines for these, especially non-conforming loans? Yeah, it's very interesting because a lot of these banks that we've talked to, they've said that it's not like the market when it crashed in 2008, where these programs went away, these banks went out of business. These banks aren't necessarily going out of business. They're just shutting off the warehouse line that would normally fund those loans. So their ability to turn it back on can be turned on in a heartbeat. It's just about knowing that if they do that, that they can sell those loans immediately. So I think that as the economy stabilizes a bit in the, in the coming months, we see what happens uh, with COVID-19 and just stabilizing as an industry and a country as a whole, you'll start to see more people coming back to work. And because of that, you'll have more comfort from a banking perspective, uh, loosening guidelines a bit, which will certainly help. I think you'll then also see the Fed's reaction to maybe backing the higher balanced mortgage loans that Fannie and Freddie do. You know, as I mentioned, those higher Fannie and Freddie loans are kind of broken as well in terms of the interest rates. But I think that once they see the market stabilizing, my opinion in theory would be they'll start you know, injecting liquidity into those loans. Now you'll see those rates drop a little more to where you've got this huge bucket of people, especially in Los Angeles County, where you've got those loans that could be greater than 550. And they're just kind of at a standstill right now because there's no market for them to refinance. But I think there will be in the coming months. So that, that's a definitely an important piece to understand. You know, and, and in the long run, Will, the interest rates will fall. You know, at some point, they will all fall to levels that we've never seen. So even if you the get something into a... Yeah, you, you broke up there. there. Um, I was going to say that even if... Uh, you get into a purchase, if you can get a loan at, you know, even at 4.9% right now, right. On a, especially a non-conforming product, and you're not happy about it, and this isn't even talking about points or any other fees, um, but you want the house and maybe you're getting a good deal on the house, you know, maybe mm -hmm. that is 5% uh, cheaper than it would have been. Um, In a normal market. Yeah, in a normal market, uh, you know, Compass just did a survey that came out uh, of uh, about 800 agents in California, Northern and Southern California. And the general consensus was that properties um, below $2 million were going to see about a five, maybe a 7% uh, price dip. And of course, this is an average. There's going to be houses that are going to go, you know, full yeah. price. And there's going to be houses that are going to go bigger than that. But the prices of properties that are above the two, especially above $3 million. Um, I was on a call the other day with uh, some, some agents around the, the country. And what they're seeing is the properties that are between two and $5 million are having the most trouble. Yes. Taking the biggest cut. They're taking anywhere from a 10 to a 15% price pressure. And that's what kind of is the general feeling among um, my colleagues that we're going to see that pressure continue to stay there for several months. The properties that are above the $5 million point are, they're so unique and often they're special properties. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the numbers, but I'm guessing that the majority of those properties are, are cash purchases anyway. So, you know, if you have money to buy a $10 million house, and you have the cash to do it. Um, you maybe pulled your cash out of the stock market, uh, you know, at the right time. So it may be a good deal to go ahead and, and push that. But back to the idea of, you know, if you can get into a rate and get the house that you want and you get it at a lower price, 
six months or 12 months from now, you're predicting, and I think you're right, that refi market will come back at a lower rate. Is that correct? I think we'll see rates that we've never seen before. And that's even what Inman is projecting. In 2021, they're predicting rates into the twos. You're talking about essentially every single person in the country refinance. It'll be an explosion if that happens. So think of it now, you're getting in on a place, you're not happy on the rate because of where the market is and nobody can necessarily control that. There's certainly some ways to get around it from structuring purposes um, as a loan, but you get in now, you may have less competition because there's less buyers in the market because more people are facing furlough and unemployment. But then what's the worst that you do? You refinance in six, 18 months and you're already in. And when the market stabilizes, that same property that you may have wanted could be a dog fight against every single person that's now back working with very low interest rates. 100%. About you know, having missed a huge window. 100%. And for a very short period of time, yes, you, you had to bite the bullet and maybe take a rate that's higher than normal you know, for what it should be. But you're not fighting against 50 other multiple offers on a place. And yeah. I've got to think that for certain price points, from my experience, between 200 to say 650 to 700,000, those are a good price points for a lot of people that are buying their first time home, whether it's a house or a condo. And, you know, you could be in a massive dogfight depending on the area that you're trying to buy. So being able to do it now and you're blessed to still have income coming in to some degree it's a phenomenal time to still buy, albeit it's a bit weirder with like virtual tours and limited, you know, exposure to the property itself prior to closing. It's still going to be, you know, seeing a benefit to buying now compared to waiting for everything to stabilize and now you're in the same pool with everybody else. Yeah. I think if you are a buyer who has a, you know, steady employment, you know, you're a doctor, you're, um, you know, you're a public employee, you work for a fire department or, or whatever. You're an essential employee and you have a steady outcome and you've been a steady right. employee, steadily employed for the last 10 years at the same job. And you maybe you were planning to buy a house this spring like millions of other people around the country. And so you've had that money in reserve. I think that the, the market has finally shifted from that you know, seller's market that we've seen creeping up over the last five years to mm -hmm. it's going to go equilibrium or it's going to go into a buyer's market. Because I think mm -hmm. what I'm hearing from, from sellers that I, you know, I, I have two listings that are on hold right now. Um, you know, the people are occupied, uh, they live in the houses, so they don't want people coming in. But if, if right. you're interested in a house and you can see what it kind of looks like through a virtual tour, then my recommendation to a buyer is if you're a serious buyer and you see the house through a virtual tour and you get in your car and you do a drive by and you get a feel for the neighborhood, you know, make an offer subject to, meaning make an offer subject to, you know, getting a walkthrough with the, the agent. Um, if that's the only way you can get into the house. If, and, and I, I think it makes sense, especially for an occupied home, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, if I had a listing and I had a, a, a seller that was okay, the two sellers that I have are, are fairly old and, and they're in a higher risk pool. So I get it. Right. I wouldn't ever encourage them to even open their house up right now. But if you're a seller, you don't want a lot of people coming through your house. So if you can beat the crowd, make an offer, and it gets accepted subject to you taking a, a walkthrough, you mm -hmm. know, two days after opening escrow. I think that's a really strong position to be in because a buyer who's well qualified and can close in that 30 day time frame, or it might be getting extended now because of some of the, you know, challenges of, of appraisals and, and inspections. But if you can close and you're going to close, that's a higher value to a lot of sellers because the bottom line, in my opinion, people who are listing their home right now during this, um, this COVID crisis that we're dealing with, they're listing their home because they either have to sell or they're really, really motivated to sell. So properties that are on the market right now and that haven't been pulled, 
whether it's an occupied property or a vacant house, um, you're looking at people who want to sell their house and, and mm -hmm. may need to sell their house. So it gives you as the buyer a little bit more leverage, in my opinion, if you can show to that, um, to that seller, hey, you know, you may not, if it's a house listed for a million bucks and you know, you make an offer and it's accepted at 950, you may be paying a little bit more for your interest rate, but you just saved $50,000 on the purchase price and you might've saved $100,000 because if it was a typical spring market and a house was priced well at a million, not unusual as you know here in LA County for a house that's priced there to go up to you know a million fifty or a million one or I've seen it go up you know I had a house that I helped people buy a year ago it was listed at a million one and we opened escrow at one three fifty so it depends on the property um, but I think if you are a, a motivated buyer um, you know work with your realtor do your research and then get into escrow because I think there are opportunities to really get good, you know, value. I don't want to say good deals because there's still going to be a lot of sellers who are going to, you know, they're going to hold on to the reality of the world as it was six months ago when they contemplated putting their house on the market. And so there's going to be challenging conversations with, if you're a listing agent with your seller. Um, but if you need to sell your house and you've got a buyer who's ready to move and mm -hmm. uh, can close, that has a premium on it right now, in my opinion. Right. Well, there's a couple of things that are going on that I think I kind of want to touch on that you were talking about. One thing that stood out is the appraisal aspect. You know, we talk about potential delays, and there may have been a little bit of a delay in the beginning when all this was coming out because we didn't quite understand how to order appraisals when you've got people that, like in your case, you've got a seller that says, I'm not letting someone in my house right now. You know, I, I'm high risk. So how do you handle that if you're not getting an appraisal waiver, meaning no appraisals required from the lender standpoint? How are you doing it? So we've seen a, a huge surge of banks that are now following the, the revised Fannie Freddie guidelines that say, try to do a traditional appraisal first. If you cannot, then you can do either what we call a desktop appraisal, which is basically a full traditional appraisal, but it's not done with the interior inspection of the property. Your client is essentially giving all the pictures to the appraiser, and they'll have some conversations to make sure everything's all hunky dory and everything's all accurate up to date, um, and then writing a standard report. And sometimes you might just do what we call a drive-by appraisal. And the appraiser doesn't even have to contact the client because he, he or she's not going into the property. So we've seen a streamline of that process my only thing is if you've got a property that shows well, you've done improvement, you spent money to fix it up to get that value, you're gonna have to think really closely about what you're doing on the appraisal front. Because if you're doing a drive-by, the, the appraiser's never gonna really see what was done on the inside. They're mm -hmm. gonna go off comps, they're gonna go off of what they see maybe online, but they're not gonna be able to tangibly see, have the conversations with you, uh, the seller really get a better sense. So it could be very dicey in terms of value um, if you're concerned on stuff like that. I've seen it go both ways. I've had appraisals come in that are fine. I've had appraisals that came in a little lower than we anticipated. Could it have come in a little higher if they'd done a full interior? Possibly, you know, but nobody wants to jeopardize their health over that. And frankly, everybody's coming in fully masked with gloves on. So everybody on every aspect is fully protecting themselves against everything as well. So that's one critical piece to understand. Yeah, I mean, if it were me, uh, I would, you know, encourage, um, you know, the option to have the appraiser come into the house and, and tape the house, meaning, you know, measure to make sure the square footage is accurate because yeah. that uh, can be a real big factor in the you know appraised value since they rely so heavily on price per square foot oh, yeah. so if you Absolutely. have a property that you know may have had an addition put on and it wasn't properly um, permitted you know that could be a real problem and in fact I read somewhere and I'm you know correct me if I'm wrong but some banks are reserving the right to do a post closing appraisal which seems crazy to me but um, they're reserving the opportunity to go back to the house in several months 
and get in there and maybe revise the appraised value. And I don't know what would happen at that point. Then are they going to come back to the buyer and say, hey, you know, we appraised your house at a million, but after getting a look at it and taping it, measuring the, the, the square footage, mm -hmm. we think, you know, it's probably closer to 950. So, you know, what are they going to do then? I mean, they're going to say, you got to pony up another 50 grand or we're going to change your rates. Is that even That's very interesting? I have not heard anything like that, at least on our end as a direct lender and broker. Sometimes it's a little different than maybe dealing with a direct retail bank. Mm -hmm. I how they would do that if you're talking about someone that's got a recorded lien on the property with a specific payment with a promissory note yeah uh, that'll be some sort of disclaimer to it or maybe it depends on the price point where they analyze on the file to see you know, whether or not they can institute something like that but i i personally haven't heard anything like that I think that's well maybe it was just a from a perspective. <laughs> there's probably a bunch of lawyers talking about how can how can we go back and claw back some of this money if uh, <laughs> if we got screwed on the drive-by appraisal, you know, and I think they, it's very challenging. You know, they put the clause in there. I'm sure that most people wouldn't even read it. We, you know, from per, from a drive-by perspective, you know, just had an appraisal that came in on Friday, and the agent was very fully prepared to help me understand that you on the property it had been permitted, and it was contributing to the value of the property. And because it was drive by, we knew the appraiser would never see it. I made sure that we had all the permits ahead of time on my end, which is something I wouldn't necessarily go and try to get for an appraisal because they would have the conversations on the interior with the agent. But because there's no contact, I made sure to upload it all ahead of time, address it with specific comments so the appraiser knew. And that way we got the appraisal in a value. So it's going to require a lot more work for everybody to be fully prepared. If you're not going to do a full interior inspection, you better be prepared with the stuff that's needed to help support your value so that there's no surprises to you as the agent or you to your seller because everyone's going to have to pony up and do a little more work. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. I, I, you know, they've been preaching this on the calls I've been in that, you know, it's, it's, it's such a different time and such so many challenges that it's really critical that the, the lender, the buyer, the listing agent and the buyer agent all maintain a really um, active line of communication and constantly update uh, each other on where they are in the steps in the process. Because, you know, if you're just going along thinking, oh yeah, we're, we're doing fine and then you get hit well, we should have had this taken care of a week ago or two weeks ago. It could kill a deal or, or, you know, delay it by several weeks, which, you know, potentially could kill a deal if somebody's like, no, I got to get out of it, you know? Well, so, and just think about the fact, Will, that the longer you go on with the deal, the longer the risk also of something happening on the buyer's end with their job. You know, it's, it's a terrible thing to say, but this is a reality where we're seeing people that are in the middle of an escrow and they lose their job or they get furloughed. And we, we have to try to anticipate this stuff as much as we can. That's why some of these questions we're asking up front. What do you know about your employment situation to understand if this is something we got to be extra conservative about? Um, you know, the other thing is some of these loan sizes, uh, people are just sitting in escrows waiting for these rates to drop because they may not qualify on the current situation if, if the loan interest rate is so much higher, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where a big difference will come in play of who you're working with on a loan. And it's not a knock on any bank. Every bank is different how they operate. Every direct lender is different how they operate. But from a banking perspective, I see a massive um, benefit to us as to what we do compared to other banks right now because we can do specialized products still, because we can do first loans and second loans. Sometimes there's a way to manipulate that loan amount and make it work for the time being to get better rates instead of sitting around waiting and waiting and waiting like for the interest rates to drop, which may not happen anytime soon for, for loans of that size. Yeah. Which is be a big example because I think it's important for buyers that are in this range to really understand what I mean. They're not doing a million dollar purchase right now. We have it structured as a first and a second. We were originally gonna go with a loan amount right around the 765 marker bridge it with a second that was, you know, around 200 to 250, somewhere in that range. But the rates were terrible on the first. We're talking 
4875 5%, you know, because of where the market is, because there's a second loan involved. So we've been sitting here waiting. And one of our banks revised their guidelines that was beneficial to the consumer. So what I ended up doing is lowering the first loan to the conforming limit of 510, increasing the second loan, almost doubling it, essentially. And it might sound crazy, except the difference is the rate dropped from a floating rate of 4.875 on the first loan to 3.5% on wow. the first loan. Are these 30-year fixed rates? It's a 30-year, yes. Are you so, seeing more, um, more people looking at uh, five- or seven-year arms? People are still looking at them. But those rates are not pricing as aggressively, in my opinion. There's still more risk tied to these short-term arms. So some of the banks that we've worked with that have traditionally been very aggressive, they're not as aggressive right now, or they're just not uh, pricing where you would think they should be. It's not where the stability is. The stability is going into those fixed-rate mortgages where they're just there's more safety there from a banking perspective to pump, pump, pump liquidity essentially into those loans give the better interest rates. So I think that for the time being, any loan, if you can do it, can make sense more on a fixed rate mortgage. And once the market stabilizes and we have some normalcy return, then yeah, if a client wants to look at a seven-year arm because their plan is to not be there for 30 years, then yeah, go for it. Look for it on the refi and then do that. You know, But if it's going to make more sense to get the deal done now on a fixed rate, that's the, the mindset you have to have, that it's not normal right now. Everything is different. It's not a normal banking industry. The rates are varying wildly from day to day. Sometimes we'll have four to five rate changes. That stuff doesn't happen often, but in the last 30 days, we've sure had our fair share of days where it's incredibly volatile, and it's very hard to pull out a loan because of how quickly things are changing. Well, th this, you know, we need to wrap it up here, but I would say that this um, information, this conversation really confirms to me why uh, a potential buyer of a property uh, really needs to work with a professional and whether that's, you know, a realtor to help them, you know, find and negotiate the house and, and, and not just the purchase price, but, you know, subsequent to that, because as you know, the negotiation doesn't stop once you agree on a price. You got to work your way through other issues. Uh, some of them never show up in the dollars. It's just, you know, everything from I'm going to keep that thing on the wall <laughs> and you're fighting over, uh, you know, something that maybe is not clearly defined in the contract and you want to get it to, you know, am I going to repair that chimney or, or whatnot? So you want to have in your corner, you want to have a, you know, somebody representing you on the purchase. And part of that is, you know, having a, a realtor who has good relationships with people like you who can give them options. And I, I get frustrated with some buyers who um, they don't understand all the work that you do behind the scenes to help them uh, really save money. And that's kind of what I try to do as well is like, you know, find ways to um, help them save money and, and not save the pennies, but save the dollars. Because a lot of people will get fixated on small things like whether it's with you with uh, a fee or a rate and not realizing that, you know, even if they got a better rate from another lender, if that guy screws up and drops the ball, I mean, I had one deal several years ago where the lender, it was a buyer I was representing and they were buying a condo and it was that they were insisted on using an online uh, lender. I'm not going to mention the company, but they, um, they totally screwed up in their evaluation of the condo building and the condo building was had a very high percentage of non-occupied owners. Mm. a lot of renters in that in that condo complex and it didn't conform to guidelines and so they came back to the buyer three days before we were going to close escrow and said yeah we're not going to be able to fund that loan that we quoted you on so if you want to go forward 
you know, we're going to bump your rate from uh, whatever it was, 3.8 to 4.8. We're going to bump it by a point, and, you know, your points on that are going to go up another point or two, whatever it was. It was outrageous. Nice. And, you know, they basically gave him a, a really difficult choice. Like, you can, you know, back out of this deal, and at that point, of course, his earnest money deposit of 25000 or whatever it was, was at risk. Or you can do this new loan. And, you know, fortunately, I had a good relationship with the listing agent and the listing agent felt bad because he said, you know, my, I should have caught that on my listing. So he let the buyer out of the, the, the contract. But, you know, trying to say, my point is that trying to save a little bit of money on a loan could put you at risk for losing, you know, your entire security, your earnest money deposit. Or, you know, having somebody pull one of those bait and switches at the end where they promise you one thing and then you end up paying more than you anticipated. And, you know, that can really hit your budget hard if suddenly you're budgeting for X and then, you know, your real world, like starting next month budget is going to be impacted by several hundred dollars because you, you hadn't budgeted that. So uh, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day on a, you know, otherwise quiet Sunday here when lockdown land. <laughs> Uh, we're all, uh, I don't have, you know, I could grow a beard like that, but it would be too itchy. And, uh, you know, we both have beautiful, uh, new puppies or relatively new puppies. And, uh, my dog would probably go crazy. He's your dog probably loves your beard. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's a big Wookiee now. Uh, so, anyway, thank you for taking the time, Michael. Um, and, uh, how can people reach you if they want to contact you directly? My cell phone number is area code 310-995-0975. So anyone can give me a call or just shoot me a text to say hello, uh, connect that way. I'm usually very quick about responding. Or if they just want to send an email, my email address is M Abram. So M is in Michael, A is in Apple, B is in boy, R is in Robert, A is in Apple, M is in Michael, at RPM, which is Richard Paul Mary, hyphen, MTG, like Mary Tom George, dot com. Got it. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions for people. I give them the run through. Yeah, and I, I, I can vouch for that, that Michael will get back to you, uh, you know, typically within the hour, but definitely before the end of the business day. Uh, with whatever question you have and he's seriously one of the most generous um brokers that i've worked with with regard to his time and taking the time to you know if i have any knowledge about this area a big percentage of that comes from my conversations with michael and him educating me so uh, again thank you for taking the time and uh We'll do this again, and uh, next time I'll figure out how to do a, a Facebook uh, Live or an Instagram Live, and we'll, we'll get it out to more people in real time, and, and maybe we can start taking questions from people as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Help them, um, you know, through this time when we're all kind of figuring out what, uh, what the future holds for us and, uh, you know, doing our best to stay stay safe, but also um, think about where we're, where we're going to be in a month and three months and 12 months. And I, I'm personally very hopeful um, that uh, we're going to figure it out as a country and as a world. But, um, you know, in the meantime, uh, once again, thanks, Michael. And we're signing off now and um, you can reach him and you can reach me, of course, if you're watching this on my Facebook page um, or my Instagram live page. You can always reach me, uh, Will Flanagan, at 310-920-1108, or on my, on my website, flanaganhomes.com. Thank you, and uh, we'll talk next time. Sounds good, Will. Take care. Bye-bye.